Amen. <laughs> Praise God. God's voice is always sounding. The Bible proves that. When one group fails to hear and their ears become plugged, there's somebody else hearing. God is a talking God. <laughs> Say, God, you're a talking God. I know that. The Bible proves it. Show me who you're talking to. Introduce me to the others you're talking to. And then when you meet that other person, he seems like a reflex of your own soul. When you meet him, you're meeting yourself, as so to speak. Yeah. And uh, I like a line in Burroughs' poem. He said, the friends I seek are seeking me. Praise All over the world, there are people reaching out yeah. with desire toward other people. Yeah. We want a pure fellowship where we're not ruled over by a political demigod who has psychic bonds, little lines onto each one of us where he's not satisfied till he steals our soul from us. We don't want that, or a denomination, or some kind of a system. We want to know the Lord Amen. and be a free man. Stand as a solitary individual before eternity. Amen. Become responsible. Amen. What the herd does, it gives a place to hide from responsibility. But God will pin the individual. Hallelujah. He'll chase him out to the wilderness where there's nobody to argue for him, no lawyer, no shepherd, nobody else. And there God will talk. <laughs> and when God begins to talk out of your burning bush, he won't talk about the wife and the children and Pharaoh and the father's failure and what's going to come. He'll talk about you, hallelujah. He'll say, I am that I am, and I'm pinning your hide to the back wall of the box canyon, hallelujah. Blessed be God. God will get at us. <laughs> yeah, Moses says, by someone else, Lord. Someone else. Send somebody else. God wouldn't change the subject. <laughs> he just bored in on Moses all the deeper. <laughs> You're the one I'm after. You're the one and caught in, in the magnetism of my desire and power. <laughs> You're not getting loose so easily. Oh, Moses even lied. He said, I am not eloquent. The Bible says he was a man mighty in words and in deeds. <laughs> yeah, you can come to the point where you don't want to do anything for God. Young Bible school student, they're enthusiastic. They want everything. They want to give to healing. They want to give to miracles. They want to give to evangelism. I hope they get them all, hallelujah. But the day will come when you will have a gift and you will refuse to use it. You won't want to use it because something will happen. And then God himself and not your enthusiasm will have to become your motivation. Glory to his name. Oh, I feel the prophetic wrath struggling for vent this night. God wants to speak. Hallelujah. Oh, it's too late in time to do anything but just shout. And to him I shout. In the name of the Lord, I shout. In despite of hell and the end of the age avalanching, I shout in the name of Jesus because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I shout because I'm angry. I shout because I've been touched with fire and when you're touched with fire you'll make an expression I never made an expression till I was touched by fire nothing short of fire would cause me to speak you may think I was always this way well you don't know what I used to be like you're looking at a person who never shouted one time before I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost not one time you couldn't have made me or bought me or paid me to shout or praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There's a shout of a king among them. How can we have Jesus Christ in our midst and be down in the dumps like city rats living among the refuse of humanity? How can we do it? You know what we are? We're like the man in the Bible, double-minded. One way, just when God's hand is on us, and then when he lifts it a little, we sag back again. So easy to sag back. 
be defeatist. Praise God. I feel like I don't fit in anywhere. I feel like I'd best be out in the wilderness all by myself somewhere. I feel like being from a former day and a former vision, and I want to tell you one thing, the Pentecostals, whatever their faults were, I mean when the movement was hot, they sought for the high mountains of God. <laughs> Today we get treated to philosophy and psychology and humanism. Some of the greatest teachers in America, you know what Brother Sexton called him? God's psychologist. All dealing with humanism, human problems, human solutions. Twist this a little bit. Bend it, compromise. We need the power of the blood. Yes. Power of the name. Yes. Power of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. I've been pressed beyond measure the last six months. I had to preach so many times. Don't feel like it. I haven't felt like preaching. In my soul, man, I don't want to. My flesh, I don't want to preach. I don't want to be preaching. A lot fell on me this week. Two times tomorrow. Five times last weekend it was. Every night this week. Wedding. Teaching that week before that, preaching that weekend three times, two times. I just said, well, Lord, pour it on. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm dying, pour it on. <laughs> One thing I hate about the present church, it seems like the misery just lingers on. Like a snake tail, you kill him and it wiggles till so the sun goes down. I feel like the man up the tree with the bobcat. John was his name. Two men out hunting raccoons, and the dog treed something, and John went up the tree to poke it out with a stick. The man on the ground says, knock him down, John, and John poked him, and it wasn't a raccoon at all, it was a catamount, or a bobcat, or a lynx, or something. The thing attacked him, and clawed him, and hissed, and spat, and bit. And there was a big ruckus going on the top of the tree. And John said, shoot him! The man said, I can, I'm afraid I'll shoot you. <laughs> And that went on, back and forth it went. Finally, John called out of the top of he says, shoot, one of us needs relief. <laughs> and so, we're finding God in these days is not rubbing the salve of moderation upon us. You know, everything at our time has reached a tremendous pitch. We're, we're living a high-key life, even here at Pinecrest, uh, I, I don't know if I pick up the whole age or what the Christians have, but uh, I'm excited, I mean, in a bad way. I feel the, the burdens and the stewing and the warfare and the thrashing and all that. It's a high-key day. And we call out to God, and you know what he does? He intensifies the situation. He turns the rheostat up from 8 to 9, from 9 to 10. He gets his hand on all the knobs and he intensifies. He turns it up because God wants a clean cut and decisive re resolution to this thing. He wants decisions for Jesus Christ. Not that we might have him as a fire escape at some future date, but that in this present moment we would hear his voice pealing across the ages by the scripture and through the corridor of spirit from the high empyrean eternity telling us what he wants and we say, yes, Lord. Hallelujah! Yes, Lord! Yes, Lord! Let the war break out. Let this cold war become a hot war. Let our enemies be manifest. Let all the masks come down until we know whom we're to shoot at. Hallelujah! The Bible says in Psalm 19 and verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And so the Bible says the universe, the heavens, the earth, and time itself are faithful. 
to declare God's glory. Oh, that the church were as faithful as nature in declaring the glory of God. The church declares a spotted history of human greed and competition, risings and fallings, apostasies and reconcilements, the undulation, the fluctuation of human changeableness. And so what Psalm 19 is talking about is called natural theology. Nature declares his eternal power and Godhead. The things that are made declare his nature clearly. I thought I would talk a little bit tonight about something God taught me when I climbed a mountain about two weeks ago on a Sunday evening, coming down from having preached Sunday morning up in the Adirondacks or up in the St. Lawrence Valley. And as I climbed that mountain trail, God taught me with such an intensity that I felt like I could pass out from it. That everything I looked at, everything I experienced, spoke into my spirit. And I don't know exactly how to start except I've read this scripture. And I want to try to bring out a few things. I see a scripture back in Genesis chapter 22 that may be suitable. Let's look at Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> The Bible says in Exodus that Moses came to the mountain of God. I believe man instinctively fears the mountain of God. How many people have testified by mouth, verbally in meetings, and also by books that they sought the Lord, they fasted, they prayed, and asked him to come and visit and when he really did come and visit, they recoiled in terror from his presence, and his presence withdrew. One of the healers of the Voice of Healing had that happen. He fasted about a month. And as he fasted, his father was a Church of God preacher, Pentecostal from the older days, I guess from the 20s maybe. Coal mining area, West Virginia, hot Pentecostals there. This man was in the Navy. He was an incredibly handsome hillbilly Irishman. Men tried to take him to the back alley and cut his face off with a beer bottle one time, and God sovereignly spared him by what we call prevenient grace. Were you aware of God working in your life before you ever met him? I'm aware of God worked in my life. I pounded a dynamite cap when I was six. It didn't kill me. That's TNT, and I pounded it between a blacksmith and hammer and a blacksmith anvil. I compressed it. I intensified the situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, with such force that I was, I was wearing canvas pants and it almost cut them clean in two off my legs. Copper fragments flying. It was near poisonous snakes. Jumped out of the top of a barn one time, lit on my feet. Uh, different things happened where I believe God spared my life. It could be my father died when I was five to spare my life. He was a vicious, violent, dangerous, unpredictable man. The things that happen, I believe all the things that happen have a reason behind them. If we could only see behind the thing to the reason. And as we go on with God, it pleases him to reveal to us why a certain thing happened. I remember the testimony of Holy Ann Preston in the book Brother Howard lent me. A lady was sick unto death up around Toronto somewhere where she lived, and her husband came and said, Ann, my wife's dying, but I know if you pray, she'll live. So Holy Ann went to God with great boldness like Abraham did with the Sodom and Gomorrah case, and she said, if I am what I claim to be, I'll have her life. And she was healed and she lived. But Anne said she lived to be a reproach on the gospel all the rest of her life. 
And God said, from now on, you seek some wisdom to work with your power. Hallelujah. You know, it's not just the answer when you get the gifts. That may be the beginning of your problems. There's not only a thing of getting a gift and using a gift, there's also something Brother Valori talks about, holding your gift in check. Anybody ever hear about that? <laughs> Praise God. John Wright Fillett had a similar experience. He reported Brother Taylor. Somebody told me about it. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. <clears throat> so maybe we could look into Genesis 22 and just read a little bit here. <clears throat> Came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham or test him and said unto Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And God said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. I think that when we are approaching the mountain of God, we instinctively realize it's going to call for sacrifice. And I believe one clear, plain element that has gone a long way toward ruining our Christianity of the past generation, that's the 30-year period, right back to the latter rain beginning, is we have had a kind of Christianity that is not willing to sacrifice. It's a blessing-oriented Christianity. And it's not easy to go in certain churches. I was preaching in a church last spring with about a thousand people, and I found that I could not be myself there. I did not have liberty to preach. I preached, you do the best you can with what you have. But with the big Sunday morning crowd, I could not open my mouth and give clear utterance. Sunday night, when only a couple hundred came, I opened my mouth and I had liberty. I was like two different men, morning and evening. And as I travel, I go to some local places and preach, and I cannot be myself. Uh, the, the atmosphere there twists my very being. Brother Valori says, uh, when he goes to a certain place, he said, if I feel like when I get there, I left a third of myself back home or two-thirds of myself because there's not an ear to hear in that place. All you can talk about is certain classes of blessings that are coming their way. And this brother I was mentioning, as he began to fast and pray, uh, fearful things began to happen in his house. Angels began to manifest. His wife, who was a sensitive uh, young Italian girl who had prayed through and received the baptism, and, and uh, he had been a backslidden Pentecostal preacher's son. He married her a Catholic, and then he saw her entering in much faster than he did. God said to him by Moses, he said, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy by somebody else. I believe God provokes us to jealousy by others. And she screamed one night and said, that brother man with the bright light, and he woke up and the angel vanished. And then in that period of time, while he fasted, God's presence flooded into his bedroom one night. He said it seemed to fill the entire room and began to bear upon me a, a, a presence of great weight and majesty and power and holiness. And he said, I recoiled in fear. And the Lord just departed, just like that. And then when he thought it over, he realized the very thing he had fasted and prayed for was coming, and he was not able to receive it. There is a terror connected with the mountain of the Lord. There is a fear, not only because it's high and distant, remote from us, but because it embraces the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen there. But about three or four nights later, God visited him again, and this time he heard the knock on the door. He opened, and God's presence came into his life. He received. And then from that point, he had 
one of the greatest ministries on the face of the earth as far as gifts operating, penetrating vision. He was a seer. He was very accurate. He was penetrating. He had healing power. He had various, various Holy Ghost operations from that time. I just wanted to relate that to show you that as you go, one of the things you're going to have to cope with is, as the brother testified, fear. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. And in my spiritual odyssey, there were several key points in life when I was confronted by the specter of fear. And had I responded to fear as Satan would hope, I would have turned around and run away and never gone that route. But as I remained, as I stood, as Paul says, having done all the stand, I believe that as we stand before the Lord, we stand against the devil. Amen. Hallelujah. When you're standing before the Lord, it's not that you're just... Uh, marking time or filling up time or wasting time or that you're a spiritual malinger but as you stand before the Lord you're standing against the devil and I believe we are even acting like yeast or leaven and keeping the entire earthly scene from rotting and falling to pieces I believe the Christian is a preservative agent in the present rotting world order just your very being here not not prophesying not seeing visions not Feeling the, the, the power of God discharged through your being, but just being a believer is significant in itself. You're like a great rock that's an impediment to Satan's plans and designs in our time. Yes. Thanks. You know what I like about older saints? They don't, they don't prophesy much. They may have the gift. They, they don't testify much. They don't sing much. They don't... Uh, show themselves, they're just there. You know what I like about them? They're pillars, they hold the roof up. Yes. I always feel good when older believers are around because I know the roof's not going to come down on them. I tell you, when a man uh, like Brother Parkins is around, <laughs> uh, uh, a man that has something, a man who has substance, to me his anointing's like an umbrella. Yes. And young people have little umbrellas, you know. And the bigger you get in God, the bigger your umbrella. And other people can come under that umbrella. I have a distinct sense that every ministry anointing extends to a different degree. And I believe some people have an umbrella like Barnum and Bailey's Big Top. It goes out and will cover thousands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise Hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, I feel a feeling beyond feeling tonight. The Almighty God. Uh, surging in my being, the word of the Lord rolling down in the deep caverns of my spiritual awareness. Hallelujah. Something's about to come forth. Hallelujah. We live in days of promise. The word of God has never changed, and God's power to fulfill it has never slackened. The Bible says to Abraham, offer Isaac there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto, unto the place of which God had told him. It is so critical in life to have an unshakable confidence that you are going to the very place God told you of. I believe, though my life has not turned out the way I thought it would, nor has it turned out the way I wanted it to, I dare to believe tonight that I am on my way to the place God told me of. I had the choice when I began to see my own human failures and foibles and uh, changeableness and fluctuation to either give it up because I did not have it in myself or for every dissolution I, man, I had with myself, I would put more of my confidence over in him. And I am confident that he who sits upon the throne can bring me to the mountain he told me of by his grace and by his grace alone. I just opened up the Bible in this meeting and looked at 1 Corinthians 15 and 10 where Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. 
And when you've said that, nothing can be added. I am what I am by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And when I started, God spoke to me back then. I received the Holy Ghost on January the 9th, 1958, on a Thursday night. At about 11 or 12 at night, I had an incredibly explosive and decisive and unforgettable old-time classic Pentecostal experience. I literally turned into another man in a moment of time that night. Literally, and with all the truthfulness I can muster, I turned into another man in a moment of time. And the next night, <clears throat> prophecy was spoken to me in a place where that shouldn't have been done, shouldn't have been possible, and yet it happened. A word was spoken the next night. And then, in that day that lasted from somewhere in 1957, maybe around the middle of the year, until perhaps around 1960, in that block of time, which I could call a day in my life, because it had a character, that, that period of time had all one character, I was literally set on fire to seek the Lord. And he told me of a mountain. Remember how Caleb carried the vision of a mountain for 45 years in his heart. It was told out of the mouth of Moses, the greatest of all prophets, he carried the vision for 45 years, and then he came one day and says, now give it to me. Hallelujah. You know what people like us are doing here, Brother O'Brien, Brother Holshue, myself? We're getting ready to receive. And in our lives, as God is adjusting us, as we're finding our adjustment to heaven, John Wright Follett took that scripture, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He rendered it this way, Seek your normal adjustment to the phenomena of heaven, yes. and God will adjust the phenomena of earth to you. Amen. As we allow God's great and refined hands to come upon our lives and adjust all things, we find out that every event in life tends to focus to one point, that is to bring us to that place, the mountain of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm very conscious that I am moving in life, spiritual. I'm not standing still, but I, there is movement in my life from where I started toward the mountain of God. Now Abraham heard from God, he's got, you might say, vision. Verse 4 says, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And I would like to blend together the teaching of Scripture and what God declared to me by the parable of nature on that Sunday evening when I climbed a mountain 54 miles north of here. First of all, there are two different kinds of men who stand in valleys and look at mountains. There are two different kinds of men. We stand in the valley and we look up. We stand here and we look up here, our vision like this. There are two different kinds of men who stand, two different kinds of persons who stand and look at mountains. We could find them recorded in the Bible. Pascal, the great French genius, said, man is both great and wretched. And what he had to say in his book that Brother Tim lent me really went to my heart because it's not always you can take a book 
and read what a genius had to say about different things in a scripture, and not just a man who had nothing but natural genius, but also a man who had on him the hand of God, as I'm convinced Pascal did. He's a man who invented a computer, one of the great mathematical geniuses of history. He got caught up into a great controversy with the Jesuits in his day over uh, real salvation. There was a salvation move in southern France at Port Royal, and Pascal got caught up in that. And in this writing, he talks about man's wretchedness and his greatness. And he says, man must be told both about his greatness and his wretchedness. And I, as I thought this evening, I realized the Bible does just that. First of all, the Bible shows me, like my evangelical fathers told me, the Bible portrays me as a rotten, no good, low down, diabolical, hell bound sinner. Can you say amen? amen. The, heart, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. All of David's expressions, their throat as an open sepulcher, the poison of asp is under their tongues. Then I said in my heart, all men are liars. Why, the Bible's full of it, isn't it? Even the great men like Moses and Jeremiah, when God would uh, talk face to face and send them on a mission, they resisted and they fought God. They had a big argument. God said, Moses, send somebody else. I can't talk. Moses was basically saying something that sounds very 20th century. I don't feel like going. Since March when I've been going out, I've had a hard time. All the time. I don't, and when I have a hard time, obviously I don't feel like going. I know I'm having a hard time, and I'm going to have a hard time. What are you going to do? Live by your feeling or go anyway? Go on gut level faith in the name of Jesus, knowing that the God who sits on the throne can turn the tables at any moment. Yeah. And suddenly open your mouth and give you utterance and put his power in you and behind you. Hallelujah. There's an experimental element in all of this. We don't know how it will turn out. The Bible says, cast your bread upon them. Make an investment in the experiment of faith. We have the peasant mentality. We like to take the ta talent, wrap it up in a napkin and bury it and keep it safe. God doesn't like that. Peasants like that, but God doesn't like that. Russian peasants, French peasants, German peasants. We're a nation of peasants in America. Our rich people are rich peasants. Our people, poor people are poor peasants. And we have a conservatism. We hold back from thrusting forth into the vision and call of God. Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. The Bible portrays us as wrecked humanity. John Wright Phillip made that expression to God many years ago when he was young. He, he came to an altar in a church somewhere. Could have been a Pentecostal service at Old Elam in Rochester. Could have been an Assembly of God church, a free Pentecostal. Came to the altar, just threw himself down and says, Oh God, I am a wreck of humanity. If you can do anything with me, take me and use me. Brother Joe Nevis was crossing a bridge in New York City one night. He says, Oh God, if you can take nothing and use it, take me. Man is wretched. We're wretched when our marriage relationships are sour. We're wretched when we can't find a mate. We're wretched when we can't find a job. We're wretched when all our friends turn us out and there's no fellowship. We're wretched when we have to leave the church and the body and the fellowship we've been in or grown up in and it seems there's no other way to turn. We've got to leave our friends or we're wretched. We go out and some of us, like Lot's wife, look back and never made it. Remember Lot's wife. It's a story of wretchedness. The man is also great. We see various men in various Bible dramas standing forth like supermen, acting in uh, superhuman capacities, talking like God, thinking his thoughts, writing God's own mind right down on parchments. And I have it in my hand tonight. I have this only because some men, for a time at least, behave themselves like supermen. Yes. Hallelujah! Yes. 
I look into the Word of God and I see it. I see a man commanding the sun and the moon to stand still. I see a man crying to God and God said, No prayer meeting. Raise the rod of authority. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. I see the greatness of man. When God's people were dying of thirst, he smote a rock and out came water. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord God who can take that kind of clay that seems riddled with the worms of sin and corruption and so transform it in his hands of genius that out from his hand leaps a man ready to be a servant of God, hallelujah, and do the impossible of necessary. A man like Paul who is short, skinny, probably bow-legged and bald-headed, a Pharisee, crippled, being dynamitized out of the uh, eastern crescent of the Mediterranean going all over uh, uh, Asia Minor and Europe and preaching the gospel to the barbarian and to the Jew, convincing them mighty that this Jesus is the Christ who was for to come. Hallelujah. Going down into a dungeon, having nothing but a quill pen and a parchment, and writing almost nothing of his miseries. You read the epistles of Paul. They don't get you down. They lift you up. And a man who wrote them was way down beneath us in a dungeon. Hallelujah. You talk about superhuman power. Paranormal states. The mystery of God, Superman striding out of the presence. And slaying a thousand Philistines. Yes, one heap, two heaps, with a job out of an ass. Heaps upon heaps have I slain, said Samson. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, I see. I've seen both sides of the mirror. I've seen myself as a failure, doomed always to fail. And I've suddenly felt myself transformed as the hand in the fire of God came upon me out from an eternal realm where there is no limitation, hallelujah, and come upon me and so made me forget myself that I behaved in a, an accustomed manner. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And so there are two men who stand down there. There's the wretched man who is overwhelmed with the troubles of this world and his own inability to cope with them. We find in Hebrews chapter 12, passage that might well have been addressed to Christians who are wretched, aware of their present difficulties and personal weakness. Hebrews chapter 12, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. See, the writer is trying to motivate them. He's picturing life as an arena. And the stands, the spectator stands, are all filled with the saints who have gone before and passed over. Adam, Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Noah. They're all sitting in the stands watching Paul's generation. That's what he's saying here. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking away to Jesus. What do you see when you look away to Jesus? You see a man, though he was marred beyond recognition, yet you can't call him a wretch. He was victorious, always victorious. Tell me where Jesus was ever anything but victorious, even facing the certain death of the agonizing torture on a Roman cross. He said in John's Gospel, and I love John's Gospel, because every layer has been peeled away until you see naked deity in Christ. With the other right, readers, the incarnation is a veiling. With John's Gospel, it's a revealing. Hallelujah. And in the face of that, he says, I have the power to lay my life down, and I have the power to take it again. Hallelujah. What a man. What a man who faced death eyeball to eyeball, and death was the one that had to back down. 
I love the passage in Acts chapter 3, I believe, or 2, where Peter preaches, and he says, it was not possible that he should be holden of death. In other words, death took him in its grip, but having had him in its grip, it couldn't hold him once it had him in its grip. Hallelujah. That's a confident man, a confident Christ, who puts himself into the grip of death, and having been in the grip, then breaks the grip. And the Bible says, having died once, he dieth no more. Hallelujah. Oh, we have a deathless Christ upon the throne tonight. Blessed be his name. The Bible says he lives by the power of an endless life. And I am convinced that in my generation, beginning in the second, third of the 20th century, that same spirit that was upon Moses, that raised Jesus from the dead, that came upon Paul, has also come upon me. I would dare to say this is that. Hallelujah. The same spirit. I have the same spirit. How many have the same spirit? Praise God. We have the same spirit. Bless God. That's something to thank God for. How many get up every morning and say, I have the same spirit. Thank you, Lord. We have received, Paul says, not the spirit which is of this age or of this world, but that spirit which is of God. And if we have that spirit which is of God, we will know things other people do not know. Looking away to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He bit the bullet, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Yes, when you stand in the valley and you look at the mountain of God, can you look up there with the proper mentality? You may covet the mountaintop, your feet may itch to climb the side, but you may not have a mentality for the mountaintop. Our mentality, the attitude we bring with us is critical. For if we do not have the right mind, we'll get nothing from that mountaintop anyway. We'll stand up there and see what map makers see, other mountains, trees, rocks, sticks, certain flora and fauna that are peculiar to the mountain. But if we go with the right God-built mentality, a mentality that is a product of the Word of God, we may meet God on the mountain of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Many have been to Mount Sinai since Moses' day, they photographed it. I was looking at photographs just a few months ago. They call it Musa Yebel, the mountain of Moses in Arabic, I suppose. But none of them saw a bush burn with fire, nor have a visitation from someone from another world who graved the face of the rock with mystic symbols that bore a salvific message for lost man. Hallelujah. Just one man was equipped with a mind for that mountaintop. And I believe, I dare to believe that God is equipping us with new minds in this very present hour. So that the seeds of the coming age and the coming move of God are already fermenting within our beings. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I, I must believe I'm standing in this place tonight for eternity and not for time. Not for a professional reason or a humanistic motivation, but for the sake of God himself and his purpose. The Bible says, verse 5, You have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Let us consider that our wretchedness is a temporary state that seemed to be necessary to bring us to something better. And this wretchedness is going to pass away like the husk of the fruit and be burned up in the fire. But as Job says, when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. And gold never changes. It does not oxidize or rust. 
Hallelujah. It's non-reactive. Blessed be God. And so the writer winds up here by giving an exhortation quoted from Isaiah chapter 35. He says, Wherefore, verse 12, lift up the hands which hang down and, and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Here is a people who would stand there and look at the mountain and say, I can't do it. And you know, a peculiar thing happened to me tonight, a confirmation. As I was uh, getting prepared to come down here, I came in that door over there, I walked through the hall, and just while I went through the door up here to the lobby, immediately I went through it, one of the young Bible school students said, I'm not a mountain climber. And a young lady said, I'm not either. <laughs> and that was the very thing I had in my mind. They had put themselves in the wretched side, the defeatist side. You know, I'm not in this mainstream of faith confession, as you probably know, but I must be a faith preacher to some degree at least. And I know that not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy great name give glory, as Wigglesworth cried out many, many, many times. I know that. Yet, why not say, I am a mountain climber. I can climb that mountain. That is for me. It doesn't cost you any more to say the positive than the negative. Brother Hoyer was describing Smith Wigglesworth and John Graham Lake. He said they were incredibly positive. <laughs> he said their near presence crackled with positivism and faith and power. He said, just to be in their presence did something for you. It said of Wigglesworth and Amy McPherson and others that when they would walk into me, there'd be a wind or a breeze stir over the congregation. It was true of Catherine Coleman in her best days also. They carried an anointing. There's only one way you can carry an anointing, brother and sister. It is by faith. You don't hold anointing with these physical digits. You hold an anointing by faith. And God as I've been feeling my wretchedness in the last six months and been going down, down, down to the low place, God has been saying, you must approach the pulpit, a meeting, and the people, and the Word of God in faith. Yes. There's no excuse just because we feel sad that we can dispense with, you must believe God. Amen. Paul says, sirs, I believe God. In the midst of incipient wreckage, he said, I believe God. And so there is a mentality that stands down here that all we'll ever do is look. And, there, and you know, the mountain of God has a funny way about it. It seems that as you approach it, it recedes into the distance. The Bible says here in Genesis 22, on the third day, after walking for three days, he lifted up his eyes and saw the place, not near at hand, but afar off. <laughs> oh, in that clear atmosphere. And the higher in God you go, the clearer it gets. We get deceived by our old earthly and psychological experience. We see a thing that looks oh so near, and we begin to advance toward it, and days go by, and months go by, and years go by, and still the mountain of God beckons to us from a distance. Hallelujah. Then is the time when we find out whether we have that quality called endurance. Praise God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so the man with the negative mentality says the mountain is too far away, it's too steep. There's another kind of a man we have in the modern world. I think we could find out about him in, in chapter 12 of Romans. The scripture came to me tonight, I looked it up, marked it in my mind. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, classic scripture talking about the renewing of the mind. I have believed for some years that the critical thing is the renewing of our mind. I preach not to inform the mind, but to renew the mind. You see, if I were to pour many theological facts or historical facts or spiritual truths into unrenewed minds, it would be like throwing gold into the wastebasket. 
for the very receptacle is destined to be burned. We must only endeavor to fill new vessels. Jesus says, men, don't put new wines into old wineskins. For old wineskins wine skins split, and the wine and the skins are both lost. But he said, men, put new wine into new wineskins. Yes. Yes. If there are no new wineskins available, God's not going to pour out new wine. And God's not going to pour out new wine just to make us silly Pentecostals either. There's work to be done. Hallelujah. I hope you can see through some of that. Blessed be God. The truth is going to be told sooner or later. The first man to tell it may get crucified, and the second and the third. But if enough tell it, there's going to be something rise up akin to a perfect church in this earth. Hallelujah. Can it come? Can we say, God, let thy perfect church come with a true anointing and a true word and something that is pure and true to the heart of God? Paul, Romans 12, When I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And when he says bodies here, I don't know if it's somata in the Greek probably, that means your whole person, your whole being. Body stands for the whole man. That's something that is good to grasp and not be a split up tripartite, uh, dangling, uh, disjointed thing. I am one. Amen. Hallelujah. Much evil comes from isolating spirit, soul, and body. And then you come up with the idea the spirit can't sin, and then you wind up with the sons of God and the witness lead people doing all manner of sin and claiming you're holy. Praise God. I've been through that. I know whereof I speak. We can teach spirit, soul, and body as a teaching construct. But I dare you to get man put out into three pieces on any laboratory of this world. I'm one. I'm a unitary being. And if, it, if I begin to sin, finally it will rot everything in me, including spirit, and everything will be lost. I had the other doctor and talked to him, and I know where it winds up to wife swapping and all that kind of thing. And I decided not to go that way. Here I stand. I, God help me. I can do no other. Consider me a madman. Amen. Hallelujah. But I'm going to stand here. I'm not moving. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to be rooted to the rock of reality. Hallelujah. Be ye clean, says the Bible, ye that bear the vessels of the Lord. Oh, it's nice to get prophecy, but I don't appreciate when blackmailers prophesy over me. I've had it done. And if they tried it now, I'd say, stop it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Amen, I said. Where's the reality in all of this? It's coming. Bless God. Just wait. Everything that cries out for judgment will be judged. Hallelujah. Thank you. God's getting a hold of me in these days, and it's scary. Yes. Yeah. Every time he comes to get a hold of me a little more, I resist him for a while because it's scary. You don't know what he's going to do, but among other things, he's going to demand sacrifice. Hallelujah. Isaac himself, the ministry, lay down what you have that I might give you something better. Oh, no, we always like to hold the known and reject the unknown. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your, <laughs> I like to give this little translation, it kind of shakes people, your spiritual cult. <laughs> Everybody has a cult. Cult means our organized way of approaching God, that's all it means. Some cults are false cults. Anyway, we'll turn back to reasonable service if you like that better. <laughs> Hallelujah. When I say spiritual cult, it may open up the ears. You say cult? First word I heard in the whole sermon was something that was misunderstood. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless God. We're like children. We hear words when we're young and we, we get them all botched in our mind. One, one student asked a band to play the Ice Cold Cadets by John Philip Sousa. It was the high school cadets. He always heard it as Ice Cold Cadets. <laughs> Little girl saying to her mother, Mother, I'd like to go to Washington and see the wonderful prisoner down there. She said, Prisoner in Washington? Who's that? And the girl says, You know, Prisoner Eisenhower. <laughs> she heard President is prisoner. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt, as a little boy, heard the preacher quote the scripture, The zeal of thine house had eaten me up. He thought a zeal was an animal. And he was afraid to go to church after that. He thought working somewhere was a nameless beast. Uh, an indescribable beast called a zeal that ate up little boys. <laughs> 
Years and years before he found out about that. I was in those things when I was a little boy. I, I couldn't pronounce words, and, and I had all kinds of false conceptions in my mind. And that's the way we are. We have misunderstandings. Our minds need to be renewed, purged of the old misunderstandings. When I first went to school and they recited the Lord's Prayer, everybody said, Amen. I, what, what man is that you're talking about? Amen? Who is he? I was a nameless like the spokesman in the newspaper, never named. Amen. Days went on and we said, Amen at the end. I didn't know it was a Hebrew word. He says, Yes, Amen. Surely coveted it. Uh, certainly, you know, something like that. I didn't know that. I heard it, amen, with a, a kind of a funny twang about it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Be not conformed to this world. One translator says, don't let this world press you into its own mold. Amen. Paul must have known that Christians tend to be like jelly. <laughs> if we were firm creatures with backbones, the world wouldn't try to put us into a mold. But if we have no backbone, we kind of flow to fit the contours of everything we go into, then the world will try to put us into its mold. If we have no distinct structure or shape, listen, Jesus Christ is the logos. Of, he is the structure of God. God's mind is structured. And when you go on with God and begin to be led by the Spirit, some people think you kind of turn into silly putty and you, you know, like the man with a thousand faces. No, when God takes you on, you begin to take on brittle edges. You begin to take on shape and form. You begin to be real. You begin to become what T.L.S. and Sparks calls a kingdom accountable man or woman. You begin to take on weight and divine substance, and the devil finds you to be a roadblock because God is in you. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. There's that kind of a man. The Greek word is hyperphroneo. He is in a continual frame of mind of overestimating his powers. When I used to go to the hayfield with my uncle, my mother's youngest brother, and his son, who was two years younger than myself, we were three different kinds of men. My uncle was an optimist. His son was more of a pessimist. My uncle was super energetic. He worked 16-hour days. He was big, six foot four. 